All right, so um, <clears throat> welcome to our forum, everybody. If you'd like to chuck your name and what country you're on in the chat, you're more than welcome to. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. We're just uh, letting everyone in. Uh, uh, just a reminder that this will be recorded and live streamed onto Facebook. So if you don't want to be in that live stream, uh, if you just turn your camera off, uh, you won't be seen. Yeah. Uh, go live. Me. They're saying what country they're on. Um, hi, I'm trying to join on a different laptop which has a, a camera working on it. Um, but uh, I'm not, I've been given um it's the zoom link by jim green but it's not working when i go on to it okay um i think we've oh. got some yeah yeah shall i put it in the chat would that help or shall i email it so i'm coming on a different uh a different um email address is that why it's not being recognized or from the one i registered with Yeah, perhaps. Um. To anyone that's still coming in, welcome. Uh, we're just waiting a few minutes to get started. We'll uh, kick off in about two minutes. If you haven't already, feel free to chuck your name and what country you're on in the chat. Uh, as a general reminder, this meeting will be recorded and live streamed onto Facebook at the same time. If you do not wish to be in that live stream or recording, you're welcome to turn your video off. person who um wanting to log in from the other computer i just put the link in the chat does that work for you it's kind of it who's that uh sana maybe no they can't log in they won't see the chat Are they calling in from my phone? I can see that the, the login here, but I want to log in on a different laptop. Um, so the just to confirm the link, when, when you try and press the link on your other laptop, it isn't letting you in? No, it's not taking me. It, it's, uh, it looks like the same address, I think. Is Jim there? Is it uh, possibly because you're on that account on that computer? I, I'm just thinking you might have to leave uh, the Zoom space here and then log back on on your other computer first off, if it's maybe not allowing you to be in both places at once. Yeah, no, I tried, I tried without the one I'm on now and it didn't work, so. Uh, yeah, Peter, all I can say is that even if we can't work it out, um, there's really not much uh, video or sharing of uh, good of stuff tonight. So if you only got the audio, that will yeah, probably be that's okay. Fine. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah, it's coming. Hey? It'll come at seven o'clock. Oh. <laughs> oh. All righty. Um, it's hit seven o five. I think we might make a start. So. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our nuclear free event. Uh, this is really exciting. And thank you everyone so much for being here. Uh, before we begin, just to go over some housekeeping things, we will be keeping all of the participants' microphones muted during the course of the event, just for the flow of our speakers and uh, the respect for them. The uh, meeting will be recorded and it's going to be live streamed onto Facebook. So if you do not wish to be seen in that, um, we invite you just to turn your camera off. Um, otherwise, yeah, we're just going to be posting this uh, live onto Facebook. If you haven't already, feel free to chuck your name and what country you're on in the chat. I'm sure we're all zooming in from pretty much everywhere. 
And as a final note, we would just like to request, especially in that chat space, but we just keep it polite and respectful. Um, we would like to keep this space a really open um, and safe place for everyone to share their ideas and yeah, their perspectives on different things. All right, so kicking off, I'd like to do an, an acknowledgement of country. So I'd like to acknowledge that wherever we are today, we are on stolen, unceded Indigenous land. I personally would like to acknowledge that I am facilitating here from stolen, unceded Wurundjeri Woiwurrung land of the Kulin Nations. I'd like to acknowledge that the First Nations people have been the caretakers of the land, rivers, skies and seas for countless generations. And I'd pay my respects to those elders past, present and emerging from this land and extend that respect to any First Nations people with us today. I'd like to acknowledge that First Nations people feel the effects of the climate crisis and nuclear energy first and worst, and that they have been on the forefront fighting nuclear energy since the very beginning. First Nations people have been doing everything they can to prevent nuclear energy and we will do it is our job to do everything we can to support them and in addition I'd like to acknowledge that the inclusions of Indigenous people throughout our work to combat the climate crisis is absolutely essential. Furthermore through our action and our work to take action on the climate crisis and nuclear energy which continues to exacerbate the conditions we live in, it is vital that we actively decolonize our actions and thinking. I acknowledge that we cannot fight this, we cannot fight the climate crisis through the lens of the colony. Indigenous knowledge and justice is so essential for a healthy future. And we must break the cycle of colonial violence and give back the land that we stole. We cannot have climate justice without First Nations justice. They are interconnected. Sovereignty was never ceded, and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'd now like to introduce myself and uh, the collective who have worked so hard to put this together and the people speaking today. So my name is Sam, I use he, him pronouns, and I will be your MC for tonight. I'm a high school student and a collective member of Friends of the Earth's Act on Climate. And I also do some work with School Strike for Climate as well. I joined this movement because <laughs> frankly, I'm, I'm quite terrified uh, of what the future has to hold at the current rate we're hurtling at. And especially for those who are marginalized and don't have the privilege of simply being able to overcome the climate crisis. And I wanted to take action. And through that, I have found this beautiful community. And these people are so passionate and just care for everyone around them. And I'm so thankful for all the hard work that they have put in to fight for a better world. This event tonight is thanks to the tireless work of these people. And I'd now like to introduce myself. Uh, sorry, I'd now like to introduce them to you. So this uh, forum is hosted by Friends of the Earth's Nuclear Free Collective and in collaboration with Blockade IMARC. The Nuclear Free Collective uh, works to research, educate and actively campaign on nuclear issues. They aim to protect people and the environment from the damage of the nuclear industry and promote a... Sorry, I think I cut it out there for a second. They promote a safe, uh, clean and sustainable energy solutions. The collective amplifies the voices of indigenous communities directly impacted by the nuclear industry and exposes the reality of uranium mining, the legacy of nuclear weapon testing and the threat, proposed, uh, the threat of proposed nuclear waste dumps. They believe that together we can realize a near future beyond uh, nuclear in so-called Australia. The collective believes that the current pressure by the nuclear industry and the Murdoch press is a tactic to delay any meaningful action and the clean transition for a livable future that we so desperately need. 
And intentionally or not, this is dividing the climate movement. The colony of so-called Australia is the third biggest uranium miner in the world. Those currently promoting nuclear energy as a clean and green solution have financial interests to do so and have no interest to deal with the consequences of this industry. This has been shown over and over again by active neglect of rehabilitation of former uranium mining sites, irresponsible waste management proposals and inappropriate risk, risk management in that sector. Our interests are with First Nations and frontline communities, workers affected by this industry, as well as the safety of the broader community here on this continent. Our aim today is to show you the other side of the picture that the nuclear lobby is painting so you can make an informed decision on where you stand and encourage you to have these conversations in climate groups that you are a part of and other social justice spaces. Now, as well as the nuclear uh, free collective and all those speakers, we've got uh, the collective's Dr. Jim Green, and he'll be answering any technical questions in the chat and uh, some questions in our space a bit later on. Now, Dr. Jim Green is the National Nuclear Campaigner at Friends of the Earth Australia. Dr. Green is an expert on nuclear issues and a regular media commentator on nuclear issues. He has an honours in uh, he has an honours degree in public public health from the University of Wollongong, and has awarded and was awarded a PhD in science and technology studies for his analysis of the Lucas Heights research reactor debates. Now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our three special guests. We have talking tonight, Scott Ludlam, Uncle Kevin Buzzacott, and Mia Pepper. They will be talking about various different issues to do with nuclear and climate related spaces over, tonight, over the course of tonight. The structure of this forum, uh, just to give a basic rundown, is the first 45 minutes, uh, the three speakers will give us an overview of uh, nuclear on this continent and the current issues relating in this climate change debate. Um, it's a fairly controversial and hot topic and we're hoping to smooth some things out. And then the next 30 minutes after that, there's gonna be a Q&A session, uh, which you're welcome. Uh, we're gonna have throughout the night in the chat. Um, we've got some collective members who are co collating the questions and I'll be asking some of the speakers at the end. Uh, and then at the very end, we're going to have another collective member, Jamila, who will talk about how you can get, in, get involved um, uh, and take further action. All right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Uncle Kevin Buzzacott. So Uncle Kevin is uh, an elder at the Arabana Nation in Northern South Australia. He has campaigned widely for cultural recognition, justice and land rights for all Aboriginal people. Uncle Kevin is an honor honorary president of the Nuclear Free Alliance. Uncle Kevin has initiated and led numerous campaigns against uranium mining at the BHP Billiton owned Olympic Dam, Dam mine in uh, so-called South Australia for their environmental contamination, uh, disseminant of indigenous land ownership and exploitation of the water from the Great Artisan Basin. Recipient of the Nuclear Free Futures Award in Ireland and the Australian Conservation Foundation's Peter Rollison's Award. He is greatly respected by both Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, people for his ongoing efforts for the protection. Apologies. <laughs> for the uh, protection of country, culture and spirit. We are very lucky to have Uncle Kevin here with us and look forward to hearing how the mining of uranium, the need to produce nuclear power, affects local and often First Nations communities. Over to you, Uncle. Can I, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's good to be on this show. Uh, I have been, uh, uh, off the word, I haven't been resting too good lately, but uh, anyhow, yeah, it's been a big 
journey. It's been a hard journey and still very hard. The developers were told when they first, that was uh, WMC, first went to Roxbury and the Lake Air Base and started doing explorations and all that sort of stuff. And uh, me and a couple of the brothers and some of the young ones, we and a couple of other old people, we went out and chased them mob off because they were going into sacred grounds, sacred area, and it's been that's how it's been ever since. And every time we try to stop them, we we're always met by the cops, the police force, the government, and everybody fully support this uh, uh, horrible. Uh, works and uh, it's still the same today we we are up against this hard mob that we can't get through to and uh, sometimes I call them bad people the bad people because they don't know what they're destroying and it's only us that knows our sacred sites from that area and there's been so many of it destroyed uh, with their roadworks and, and their, their explorations and all that sort of stuff. Uh, I've been in and out of court with the, trying to get through to the, the, the mob about uh, what they were doing to us and our land. Uh, I think I might be one of the lucky ones. Maybe I'm not the lucky ones. They're still around to tell the story. There is a lot of our mob, young and old, have already passed on because the amount of pressure that's uh, being put on them. And uh, it's... Uh, nothing worse than coming across the sacred site that's been destroyed. It, uh, it sort of rips you. Rips you all angles. And uh, I think uh, these people don't understand that. It's all about the greed. It's all about the, uh, how much they're going to make out of it. Even the shareholders who's, in, who's invested in uh, BHP, they don't know. They're just throwing the money, uh, uh, investing in it, and they don't even know what they're, what they're destroying. Uh, they're destroying the land, they're destroying us, they're polluting the beautiful uh, environment. And uh, I keep saying that, uh, that the money can't save you, the pollutions can't save you, but what you're destroying can save you if you really want to be saved, if you want to live peacefully. So we've lived like this, the old people lived like this for 40,000 years plus. And we never had any money, never had one cent. We never had to dig the land up. We couldn't dig the land up because we loved the land. And also we knew what would happen if you did dig up your land you knew uh, the, uh, the outcome of it. So that's why we never even touched it. We couldn't even make a brick. We couldn't even make a brick to build a house or a double story. We just lived under the old camps, the old ways. And uh, 
mind you, because we knew how to do it. You got to have it up there to be able to live. And on that old country. And uh, the lake air itself, with all its waterways and rivers and mountain springs, there a lot of that's gone. They don't flow like they used to. They used to flow like big fountains, high as the house. And they had no machinery to do that, pumps and that to pump it up, it just, it just comes out of the ground by itself. And that's the way it's designed. And not only just the people, but the, the, the wildlife. They got pounded just as much as we did. And uh, the hard part, and it's still the same these days, the hard part is getting that message through to those people. And uh, I guess the background, the guts of it is uh, the curriculum that these people in their school, this is what they learn at their school. They've been to a different school education curriculum than I've been. People like me, we we know the land, we love the land, and that's it. We've had uh, old people, uh, grandmothers, grandfathers, all the mob, educate us from when we were born, more or less. So we knew not to not to do those horrible things. Uh, and then, of course, what then comes along native title, it's uh, another government arm of the government, I guess. It uh, gets people and they dangle the carrot, which is the money. And our, some of our people have been, they're poor in that sense, as far as the rich today world goes. Uh, so they signed the deal, signed the name on it, and uh, they do the deal. They get a couple of carrots for it, and then I'm, I'm, I've got to argue. Then they divided us. I've got to argue, not only me, but we've got to argue with these our own mob, our own family, not to do any deals with the government and. Uh, uh, it's pretty full on. And what's happening now as we talk, we've got to sit by and watch our sites, sacred sites, deadly, deadly sacred sites, get destroyed before our eyes and we can't do a thing about it. Otherwise, they'll lock us up and we'll, we'll die in jail or whatever it is. And uh, they, at the moment, have got all these the cops, the army, the navy, and all sorts of things. And uh, they have made money so important that uh, to, to travel from A to B, whereas one time, like I said, we didn't have it. We bartered with people. We could walk all over this country, the brothers and sisters next door, down the road, and uh, they put up all these obstacles like uh, borders and whatnot. They've got their policy down on us, but we still follow what we know, and we know that we that's our agenda. They've got 25 or 100 other agendas. Our agenda is only one, and that is to look after ourselves and look after the old country. Looking after the old country is first. You've got to put that country first before you. Because we need that not only 
that it got us here from 40,000 years plus, but we need that for the next little ones, for our little ones. And we need our sacred sites and all our beautiful place out there so that we can educate the little ones about all the bush tuckers, bush medicine and all that sort of stuff that that will fix you up. It's proven it's been proven over 40,000 years. And anyhow, you better cut me off. I don't know how long I can talk for, because I can talk for days sometime. And uh, yeah, it's Yeah, it's 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 really devastating. Yeah, <sighs> it's hard. It's hard to uh, explain to other people. And sometimes a bit of frustration comes in, and uh, then there's a lot of anger out there. There's a lot of work out there to be done for all the people. And uh, this is what I'm saying: if uh, other people want to live on our country. They, then they're going to have to come over. I think you said it a bit early part about supporting our mob. So we ain't got the resource. We're not equipped to be able to deliver all the stuff we're talking about. We can open up doorways. We can open up gateways. We can open up everything if we have the chance. Some people don't want to do that. Some people say, let them go. Don't worry about them what goes around, comes around, or whatever. Now, we got the recipe for this land. We know how this works. They can't do it. It's not their thing. The government can't do it. They're on a mission that's impossible. They're not going to be able to deliver it because they'll always hit a stumbling blocks. We know the land. We've got to love the land. Yeah. And we need to sit down and have a big corporate plan of some kind so we can sit down and say, what do you want? War or peace? You're going to make peace with us? What are you going to do with your kids? Our kids are going to hate us. Parents, us Nanas and Papas and whatever we are, because we're going to leave them in a big mess, toxic. They've got all, they'll have all the disease, they'll have everything. The airway, the skyway, the waterway, it's going to be just polluted the way these people are going. So we have to stop those people. Uh, I'm not talking about taking up arms and, and doing it that way. Talking is the best way. Sit mm. down and yarning. Sit down and listen. Absolutely. And that's, yeah. I might give that a break if it's all right for a minute. Thank you so much, Uncle Kev. It's your words and your power are really, really inspirational. And I think um, I can speak for all of us where I'm really thankful that you were here with us today. Um, to all the participants, if you'd like to support Uncle Kev, uh, there is a crowdfund uh, to support his work. And if you have the capacity, that would be awesome if you can make a donation. Uh, the link is in the chat. Um, apologies, I had to switch computer. My audio was not wanting to work. Now, Sam. yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing, because I'm getting a bit, uh, what's the word? I'm not as fit as I used to be. And I haven't been back up the old country for a while. And I'm not equipped and resourced enough to get up there. I need runners, I need carers, I need camera people so I can go back up there and and have a look at what more damage has been done so I could uh, make uh, stories about it so I can send it out to the world and uh, and hopefully get the message through to the developers and 
whole less minded mob to to stop doing what they do. Absolutely. Look, if you would love um, any donations to Uncle Kev's crowdfund would be absolutely amazing. Uh, it's so vital that we um, uplift uh, the actions and voices of First Nations people to the forefront of this fight. Um, before I introduce the next speaker, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I'm seeing a lot of engagement with the chat. We'd just like to um, remind people just if we could keep it on topic with the uh, issue at hand, the, um, our moderators, the collective members of the Nintendo Free Collective are doing an amazing job collaborating all the questions. It's just a bit hard um, if, yeah, we're going a bit on topic. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Scott Ludlam. Now, Scott is a uh, Australian former senator representing the state of so-called Western Australia between 2007 and 2017 as a member of the Greens party and is an all round general legend, to be honest, um, given his crusade to fight against the odds of everything. A filmmaker, artist and graphic designer by trade, he has produced a 30 minute documentary titled Climate on Hope, and it outlines why he believes nuclear energy isn't the solution to climate change. Scott recently published a book, uh, his book Full Circle, A Search for a World That Comes Next. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Heap Sam. And um, I, I was told years ago, never be put on a speaking list after Uncle Kev, because I'm um, a bit blown away. It's so beautiful to hear you speak. I wish we were sitting around a campfire rather than all on our computers. Um, but you, you give me hope and inspiration for so many people for such a long time that you've been in this. I'm one of these kind of fortunate white greenies. I got to choose anti-nuclear work and uncle didn't get to choose it because these bastards came to him and onto his country. So I think we have to, I'm, I'm glad that, that you've kind of grounded this conversation for us because some of this gets a bit academic we talk about kilowatt hours and parts per million and, you know, millisieverts and how, how much radiation and how much space is this stuff taking up. It's not academic at all for the people on the front line who've been fighting this industry for decades and the industries that came before it for 231 years. Um, so thanks, Uncle, for your words. I'm speaking from uh, Ewan country on the south coast of New South Wales on land that was never ceded um, by the traditional owners of this land. I figure there's, there's two broad reasons why you might be on this call. Um, one of the reasons is that you're working on climate campaigns, you know that nuclear is a dangerous distraction, and but you wanna be clear on what the arguments are because here we are again having this same conversation that just comes around and around and around. They never stop talking about it. So that might be why you're on this call. The other reason is that you're working on climate and you understand just how much trouble we're in. And you've thought, as I've done, um, we're in so much trouble. We have to get out of coal and gas now at a speed that is actually a bit hard to comprehend. You might be on this call just to find out Maybe we should just be building anything. Maybe all the options, no matter how bad for uncle and his mob or for other reasons, the nuclear weapons connection. Maybe you're of the view that we just have to suck it up and build whatever's out there. I got the sense actually that there's a couple of folk in the chat who are coming from that. You look at the climate emergency and you think we better just build all of the options um, as fast as we can. Now, I respect those points of view as well. And I'm glad that those folk are, are here with us because I have to check my assumptions every few years as well. If you understand what is happening to the climate and the trouble that the oil and gas companies have put us into, you, you generally would look around and, and want to make sure that we haven't left any viable options on the table. Um, obviously, I, I think nuclear not only doesn't have anything to offer us at this point, it's a really dangerous distraction. And so I want to thank Foe and the crew who've been working on this for years and years for 
bringing this conversation together and just talk quickly about why I think that's the case. Um, there's one, there's one really simple argument, right? If there was any that nuclear energy could displace a single ton of coal or gas in the next 10 or 20 years in this, do we really think that if nukes were a threat to fossil fuels, that Matt Canavan would be in favor of it? Because right after those submarines got announced, the first people that hopped into that hopped onto Twitter and hopped into the editorial pages of the Australian saying, oh, if we're gonna have nuclear submarines, we should have nuclear power as well. The first people pushing for nukes were Matt Canavan and the Minerals Council. The two biggest promoters of coal that we basically have in this country suddenly think that nukes are a good idea for this climate threat that they don't actually believe in. They know that it's safe to jump on the nuclear bandwagon because they know that nuclear poses no threat of displacing coal or gas in the near future. They know that it's safe to jump on that bandwagon. A, because it's no threat to coal, and I'll go into some details as to why in a second, but B, because it's a fantastic thing to wedge the greenies. You know, it's a, it's, in politics, they call it a dead cat, something that stinks so badly that it distracts everybody from whatever it was that we were talking about and then we're talking suddenly about this new thing that stinks. What we were talking about was state capture by enormous offshore mining corporations who have held climate policy hostage in this country since the 1990s. And now we're being asked to believe that these same huge offshore mining corporations have the solution in nuclear power. It's the same people just wanting to sell us uranium as want to sell us coal and gas. So if your antennae are a bit twitching, then it is safe to trust your instincts that maybe Canavan is as wrong about nuclear power as he is about literally everything else. So what this push is designed for is to exploit the desperate situation that fossil companies have put us in, which means that we do have to address some of the arguments, particularly for the people on this call who have come at this in good faith, who are just saying, maybe we should just build everything, right? Uh, and for the people that we're in contact with in our campaigns, whether we're working on anti-nuclear work or on climate campaigns, that we do have to address some of the arguments that they're putting forward. If I was going to sum summarise them, and I reckon Mia um, will probably do a better job of this than, than I will, and we've got Jim in the chat as well, the three major kind of arguments that we hear for why we should maybe take another chance on nuclear. First one is, it's proven you could build nukes quick. Uh, and it could, it could displace huge amounts of coal and gas very fast. And so that's why we should go for it. Um, the second one is, all right, actually it can't do that. Like it's really obvious that it can't do that, but we have all these new generations of reactors that are just about to leap off the drawing board. They're small, they're modular, they're very fast to build. And uh, so actually the old generation of nukes, we can't trust, but these new ones that are just around the corner, we should build those. And the third line of argument that they sometimes put is that all these issues about radiation is a bit overblown. Uh, that, you know, Greeny crew have overstated it. Chernobyl was harmless. Fukushima didn't kill anybody. Three Mile Island, you know, didn't, didn't hurt anybody either. And that the radiation threat has been overblown. So what I wanna do is just go through each of those really quickly. The nuclear industry, as it exists actually in the world, not the imaginary one, but the real one, is in enormous trouble. It peaked in 2002 in terms of number of reactors operating in the world. It's been in decline, quite literally, since the late 1970s. But the enormous lag time that it takes to build nuclear power, power stations has this kind of built-in inertia such that we've got this fleet of reactors of the average age of which is 31 years old. So they're old plants that have been around for an awfully long time and nowhere in the world is building nuclear energy of the of kind of old kind of power stations at anything like the replacement rate that they're being closed or that they're gonna to need to close in the very near future. And it's partly, partly the reason is cost, that it's the most expensive technology for boiling water to spin a turbine that anybody has ever come up with before, right? It's catastrophically expensive. 
and it gets more expensive with every generation. So what's happening with solar and with wind and with batteries is that with every generation of that gear, the cost is coming down. Nuclear has been going in the other direction since the 1960s. Every generation they build are more expensive than the generation before. And that's why that's one of the reasons why they're in enormous trouble. Nobody will insure nuclear power stations at any scale, large or small, because they can turn from an asset into an uncapped liability in about 90 minutes. It can turn from your five or $10 billion nuclear power station into a radioactive hole in the ground with limitless liabilities in half an hour. And that's why the insurance industry hasn't touched nuclear power in decades. They do take on average of the plants that are being built in the early 21st century, not the imaginary ones, but the real ones, they take on average 10 years to build. So even if we started the licensing and environmental impact assessment process here in Australia, the absolute earliest you get a plant online is the mid 2030s. And a lot of these things take much longer than that to build. I wanna throw, cause we're times a little bit limited, but I do want to throw, I'll throw a couple of links into the chat as I go. Uh, my favorite reference on these questions about like, how is the industry actually performing in the world? Not what, what uh, advocates say, but like, how is it actually going? This is great. Uh, hang on a second. This is called the World Nuclear Status Report. These have been going for years and years. It's written uh, by people who know the technology. They're not really advocates in either direction, they're technologists. And all they do is every year they say, who's building them, who's closing them down, how are they going? Uh, and that really gives us a snapshot uh, of how the industry is performing. And it's in enormous trouble, which is why they tend to change the subject away from generation one, two or three reactors and talk about these new generation of reactors just around the corner. Sometimes you will hear these referred to as generation four. I'm pretty sure there have been a couple of uh, links gone into the chat about that. Um, generation four, these new or small modular reactors are a real hodgepodge. Some of these are designs that have been around since the 1950s that are a kind of evolved nuclear submarine designs. Some of them are proposed to burn thorium. Some of them are proposed to burn nuclear waste uh, coming from older generations of reactors and convert that into less lethal kinds of material. And the, the main thing to know about this gear is that it doesn't exist, right? They can't get out of prototype stage. The reason that nuclear has had the limited success that it has is because of economies of scale, that they come in blocks of a thousand megawatts, like the size of a really large coal-fired power station. As soon as you try and scale that down to this kind of small modular, you know, shipping container size or, you know, a small factory sized, small modular reactor, the costs balloon through the roof. Again, um, there are other folk who are much better at this than me. I'm going to chuck a couple of links into the chat. Here's, here's one that would be funny if it wasn't so serious. Bill Gates has been trying to get one of these plutonium burning reactors off the ground uh, for a long time. He's in enormous trouble. The other one that you'll hear about a fair bit is thorium which also doesn't exist. And so what's happening is the nuclear industry and some of its advocates have pivoted from promoting the technology that actually exists in the world, which is in huge trouble and on the way out to promoting these reactors that don't exist and saying they're safe, they're also cheap, they're also small, they're also fast. And you can say all these things if your reactor technology doesn't exist right? It hasn't got out of prototype stage. The ones that the small modular reactors that have been built in the world have obviously been delivered late and are in enormous trouble. The third thing that they'll come back at us and say, uh, and sometimes you'll see it expressed is in, in bananas, like bananas have potassium in them, and bananas are also radioactive, uh, and that nuclear is harmless, or it emits, you know, a working nuclear power station emits less uranium fallout than a coal-fired power station. Um, a well operating, for a well operating reactor, that's actually potentially true in some instances, which is not an argument uh, for, uh, for nuclear so much as an argument against living downwind of a coal-fired power station. The way that they managed to kind of fabricate these statistics about how harmless radiation from nuclear power stations 
is by erasing all of the other stages of the nuclear fuel chain, erasing the, the catastrophic damage that's done on Uncle Kevin's country from mining and the radioactive tailings that are left behind, erasing the reprocessing wastes or the spent fuel storage or the shipping, uh, the shipping impacts of moving the stuff around the landscape. So I've kind of got a, a fairly low tolerance, but I'm gonna throw as I've been doing, if you don't believe me, and that's entirely fair enough, um, believe the doctors who do this stuff for a living. FO has published some fantastic stuff, but it's also aggregated a lot of really useful and valuable research on the, on the health impacts of chronic levels of uh, a low dose radiation, which the industry says is safe and which doctors say absolutely is not safe. So this dead cat needs to be disposed of safely so that we are not squabbling amongst ourselves about whether this dangerous failed technology has anything to offer apart from distraction. We need to be all on the same side, that clean energy is the way forward. But there's a caveat to that, is that I don't think renewable mega projects should get a free pass either. If you get out there with your sun cable project or with your, your kind of clean energy mega project on occupied land and the, tradi the traditional owners say, you can't put that here, or ecologists and our greenie folks say, that's a terrible place for a wind farm, the greenie technology doesn't get a free pass either, right? Like we actually have to be very aware that every uh, project has its impacts. Uh, and not kind of turn a blind eye to this sort of stuff just because it might be convenient to us. I'll leave it there. I know that uh, Mia is going to do a much better job of this than I have done. Um, but thank you again to Fo for, for bringing us all together. Thank you to Uncle for grounding this conversation in reality rather than in statistics. And God only knows what's been going on in the chat while I've been talking, but I look forward to, <laughs> to uh, the Q&A. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, oh, that was that was really amazing, and it was great to yeah, just to get a really general like forward rundown on everything. Um, I think it really helps ground out some facts. Um, yeah, look, before we move on to the next speaker, um, I know we keep saying this, but I just want to remind the chat space, um, especially during uh, the times when speakers are speaking, if we could just uh, keep it on the down low, just for the courtesy of others, because it um, can be uh, a big distraction. Questions are welcome at the end, and um, especially the frequently asked questions will be collated. Um, but yeah, also just remind us to keep it respectful. Um, we can have an issue with the movement, but let's try not to attack people directly. Um, yeah. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our last uh, special guest for tonight, which is Mia Pedder. So Mia works with the Conservation Council of um, WA and the Mineral Policy Institute, and is a lead author of a submission to the uh, EPBC review by the national and state environmental groups on nuclear issues, and is a co-author of the recently re released report uh, which is the road to a nuclear-free future for WA. Mia also facilitates the Australian branch of Don't Nuke the, Don't Nuke the Climate, which is a network of anti-nuclear organisations and networks from all over the globe that work together to keep nuclear out of the climate agreement, uh, out of the climate agreements and the implementation of the Paris Treaty. Um, yeah, welcome Mia, over to you. Thanks. I'm going to talk on the phone like this because there's a little bit of background noise, so I'm not going to be on speaker. I hope this is okay talking on the phone to the computer. Um, thanks so much for having me and thanks so much, Uncle Kev, for being online. And, and Scott, it's so good to hear you both speak and, um, and so good to be reminded and to put at the forefront of our minds the, the human cost of this industry and I guess um, some of the I'm going to talk a little bit about the politics of what's happening um, and 
I guess, the place that we come from at the Mineral Policy Institute and Conservation Council of WA is, is looking at the history of the impacts of this industry um, as a reason to prevent it from growing and, and creating further damage. And particularly in Western Australia, we're fighting against four proposed uranium mines here and um, particularly one um, at Mulga Rock just outside of Kalgoorlie where traditional owners there um, are mixed from both being in Western Australia but also being refugees from South Australia, um, people that were forced out of their country because of the nuclear weapons test and then now um, the place that they, they began to call home and, and took care of and became custodians of is now under threat from uranium mining um, and what is deeply concerning now is that we're seeing a slight increase in the uranium price, which is making small, unviable projects a little bit trigger happy. Um, and uh, particularly with Mogul Rock, which is run by Vimy Resources, they're trying to get the shovel in um, when, the, when the project doesn't make sense. And what is more dangerous than a uranium mine is a uneconomic uranium mine, which this one is, where you can see... Um, yeah, a trigger happy company start start digging and then fall flat. Um, and what what we've seen around Australia is the failure of companies to rehabilitate country um, legacies that we see up in Rum Jungle, that we're seeing unfold in Kakadu National Park at the Range of Uranium Mine um, in in Queensland and in South Australia, the abandonment of uranium mines and that ongoing legacy of radiation um, and pollution in our environment and you know, in the impacts on communities, on on animals that people hunt, um, on that beautiful country is, is something that we, we can't afford to see happen again in Western Australia. We need to shut down in South Australia at Uncle Kevin's country and um, and we need to make sure that companies up in the Northern Territory are forced to, to clean up that country at Ranger. Um, but on to nuclear power, which we've, you know, from an Australian perspective in the uranium story, we're really worried about um, any increase in nuclear power because that means more demand for uranium mining. I don't think there's any plausible scenario that we would ever have nuclear power in Australia. I think it's it's fanciful and it's a dangerous distraction and for all of the reasons that, that Scott Ludlam outlined. Um, but there is a very real risk in, in foreign countries that there is going to be um, a push for nuclear power. And we've seen that over the last year, particularly in Europe and around in some of the lead up to COP26. So um, we started to see it with a thing called the European Taxonomy at the end of last year, where there was a, um, a green energy paper. So the European Parliament was going to endorse a certain set of technologies as green energy. Um, and that would mean huge government investment and public investment in those uh, energy resources, and those energy technologies. Um, there was a huge push from the gas industry and the nuclear industry to have gas and nuclear included uh, as green technology. Um, the European Parliament at the end of last year decided not to include them, but that they would further investigate um, those, those technologies. They didn't want to slow down and delay any decision or investment in in all of the other renewable energies, but they did. Um, but they, yeah, I guess the lobby of the nuclear and the gas industry was too strong for them to say a flat out no. And so, for over the last year, um, European countries have had this to and fro and fight over over nuclear and gas. And so, we're still waiting for an outcome um, on that from the European Parliament on whether they will include gas or nuclear and the implications. Of that, of that are, are huge and significant both in the countries that already have nuclear power that don't want to see an expansion of nuclear power, but also for countries like Australia and Africa, um, Canada and Kazakhstan, where, where there's uranium deposits and, and we're deeply concerned about the impact on, uh, on the threat of more uranium mining. Um, COP26 has been a... a far better story in that the nuclear industry has largely been blocked from attending um, at least they're definitely on the fringe which is where they belong um, but there is a huge push from the nuclear industry around COP26 in Glasgow um, for um, to promote nuclear power as green 
uh, green energy. Um, the other thing that is significant in Australia, which, um, you know, I said earlier that I don't think nuclear power is at all plausible in Australia, and I think we can attribute a lot of that to both the Greens and the Labor Party for um, their position on nuclear. Scott Morrison recently on the nuclear subs issue said again that he was not going to at all explore nuclear power because there is a lack of bipartisan support. And that bipartisan support is really significant. You know, there's, we see news polls come out all the time saying this many people would potentially possibly consider nuclear power under these circumstances or, you know, um, and, and news polls are, you know, we, I don't think we should pay too much attention to them when the reality is you've got the Labor Party and a significant number of unions which represent millions of workers around the country who have been opposed to nuclear power and remain opposed to nuclear power uh, for decades. And none of the reasons have changed. None of those reasons that um, Scott talked about have changed. The promises of new technology that solve all the problems of nuclear waste and links to nuclear weapons, you know, 10 years ago, they were still 10 years away. Today, they're still saying, oh, it's 10 years away, and then it'll be another 10 years away. Um, and that's a lot of these technologies have, and Jim uh, Green will tell you, have been, um, you know, on blueprints for decades and the reason that they've never made them off those blueprints and into real reactors is because they're not economic and they don't make sense and they don't solve uh, the problems. Um, but so in Australia, we had a whole series of, of inquiries into nuclear power and they largely came up with the same answer that nuclear power is too slow, too expensive, it's not popular, it would cause legislative reforms that um, could take decades. Um, the public opposition is significant and, um, yeah, there's a whole, a whole suite of barriers for it in Australia. But what is really concerning is that there's been an energy uh, roadmap agreement, a, a UK partnership um, on energy technology. And in that, um, small modular reactors has been included as something that the government will look at to fund. So not funding it here, but funding um, the UK to develop that technology. So I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for people in Australia to be asking questions around where, um, where our public funding is being spent. When it's being spent on a technology that we have prohibitions against, I think we should be asking questions. And Scott, I wish you were in Parliament to ask them because you, you were always brilliant at holding, holding um, the federal government to account. Um, look, the other thing I just wanted to um, flag, I guess, is a bunch of the don't nuclear climate content. So um, in the lead up to COP26, we'll be launching a civil society statement that over 200 organisations have signed on to. And um, that's really significant. And it's, you know, um, the response from countries who are um, at the pointy end of this industry um, have really responded strongly to. We've um, had a lot of response from people in Africa, Taiwan, Korea, Canada, the States, all across Europe. Um, so people who have experienced the nuclear industry in some of its worst forms. Um, so I'm just going to... I want to share my screen. Maybe a host can let me do that. Working. I think you should be able to do it, Mia. Are you a co-host? Yeah. That again. Oh, look. If I can't, I'll just uh, post some links in the in the chat after. But um, we there's uh, a group of people in Germany who'll be in Glasgow during COP26. Um, strong allies that have been to Australia and worked with Australians before um, and they will be posting from Glasgow. So whenever there's things that are happening around the nuclear story, they'll be there. So um, I guess just check out their Instagram page. That's where most of the activity will happen from them um, during COP26. And it'd be great if you can 
um, share that amongst your networks and track and follow what's happening um, and respond to that. Um, on some of the, the technical questions, um, there's the Don't Nuke the Climate Australia website and Jim Green has done a fantastic job putting together a myth-busting page on nuclear and also a myth-busting page specifically on small modular reactors. Um, so that's in there. Um, also our Twitter, we've got a Twitter and Facebook and the, it's always good information on there and I know lots of people online now um, follow those, even if they disagree with some of the things we put on there. Um, and I'm also just going to add one other link that I think is really important to look at and, and really important to talk about is that, you know, um, the safety issues that we talk about with nuclear are, are all issues that are exacerbated by climate change. And um, I can't remember who said it, but they said, we need to solve climate change for nuclear to be an option. Um, and this article here that I just um, posted, the Tech Explore one, um, has modelled and looked at the frequency of nuclear reactor shutdowns in response to climate change, um, which is really significant when we're talking about energy security and we're looking at the safety of nuclear power and some of the scenarios that we're seeing evolve now and ones that we can expect to get worse as climate change continues to evolve, um, nuclear power is just increasingly unsafe. Um, the other really um, important thing I think we need to think about, and I, I hate to reference Twiggy Forrest, but I will, um, because he made a lot of sense last week when he talked about the security issues around nuclear reactors. And if we were, and Al Gore said this too, if we were ever going to consider nuclear power to back out of fossil fuels would need to put them in so many places that the security risk of, of nuclear and nuclear material would just be unmanageable. And, um, and I think we're living in a time where those things, those dual risks of climate change and the impact or the threat of that on nuclear power, as well as the security threat of those reactors becoming military targets and that material becoming more um, available uh, are, are two really huge threats that I think we can't underestimate or, or shouldn't sideline at all. They should be very front of mind because they are incredibly real and frightening. Um, and not to leave on a frightening note, and I'd, I'd love to kind of cycle back to where we started on mining um, because there is a lot of talk about renewable energy as a solution and, and I think that's the one that we need to really pursue. But like Scott said, and like lots of other people have said, it does involve mining and we need to look at a better way to do mining and we need to look at better ways to talk and engage and respect traditional owners and rights to say no. Like just because there's a huge rare earth deposit there and we need solar panels doesn't mean we can ride shotgun over traditional owners if they don't want it, if there's sacred sites there. Like we just have to do mining better in a more respectful way and accept no means no. Um, and to start that in Australia, we need to change laws that give traditional owners rights to say no. Um, veto rights, we need to change the Native Title Act um, and we need to absolutely get new environmental laws that put the protection of environment at the very, very front of mind and the rights of traditional owners before that. Thanks so much for having me online and look forward to the chat. And um, thanks, Jim Green, who's here. He'll have all the answers to the technical things. Thank you so much, Mia. That's really awesome. And we are so thankful to have you with us. Now, that concludes the speaker section uh, of tonight's forum. Now for the next about, uh, I would say, 15 minutes or so, um, we're going to be uh, answering some questions that we've had in the chat. Um, obviously, there's been a fair bit of um, discourse, which has been awesome. And I thank the people who remained respectful. Um, you guys are legends. Uh, we're all, yeah, all legends. Thank you. Um, now, our first question is uh, for Scott. And the question is, do small nuclear reactors have anything to do with weapons? 
Well, they're all they're bound up in the same fuel cycle or fuel chain. The, the trick with that question, I guess, is that there's no real settled definition of a small reactor. Like I was kind of tried to sketch very briefly, and there's others on the call who could probably handle this one better than me. It's a whole menu of different technologies, some of them completely imaginary, some of them that they've been trying to get to work since the 50s, uh, and some of them that are absolutely directly related to weapons technologies. So it's not really possible to generalize. The trick is, if you're, um, if you're using enriched uranium as a fuel, then that's coming from an enrichment plant that was born out of the nuclear weapons industry, and that is absolutely weapons related. If you're using anything that's, that's uh, plutonium at any degree of enrichment, then same, somebody needed to go and reprocess nuclear fuel to provide the plutonium. But what you will see in some of the promo material for some of the small modular reactors, what they're trying to do uh, is feed uh, weapons grade material or like surplus plutonium or stuff that's contaminated plutonium with plutonium into these small modular reactors and then somehow uh, it goes away and then it's not dangerous anymore so that it's a way of actually removing weapons grade material from circulation which sounds nice but nobody's got it to work like you can't nobody's figured out how to actually do it um, in the meantime it just feels like a dangerous distraction uh, I think what we should do is sign the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. Let's just be absolutely direct about it. Sign the Ban Treaty so that Australia is no longer a nuclear weapons umbrella state. That initiative came from Australia, came from Australian activists in ICANN. Do that. And also close down the nuclear industry and just let this failed experiment stay in the 20th century where it belongs. We don't have time to fool around with stuff that doesn't exist. Awesome. Thank you for answering that question, Scott. Um, our next question is uh, for Uncle Kevin, and uh, the question is, uh, what allies um, do uh, what allies support um, a nuclear free future and land rights? You know, who can we who can we engage with that you really think are uh, great in this in this fight? Uh. I'm not fussy. I, I will take anybody. I'm so desperate at the moment. I need the good camera people. I need a couple of good vehicles, maybe a truck to cart gear up, maybe a bus to take some people. And uh, I, uh, it all depends on how my help how that's going to hang on because I've, I've had all sorts of sickness from all this stuff and uh, I'm a lot slower than I used to be and I'm getting slower. But uh, yeah, if anybody out there bored and want to... Friends of the Earth. Uh, friends of the Earth mob if they're bored. And, but uh, the thing is I can't pay them. I pay them with stories, a poem with culture, a poem with all that stuff. No money. I've got to get people not thinking about money. Oh, you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. <laughs> Crunchy. Thanks. Crunchy said we'll be there. <laughs> Crunch. Ah. Awesome. Um, our next question is for Jim, and the question is, what about the pollution and damage to First uh, Nations land from renewable sources? Yeah, uh, well, it's a great question, and there isn't a great answer, I'm afraid. It's uh, a difficult problem, and... Uh, there's a really concrete example there, which is the uh, rare earth mining in WA, and it's all the ore is transported to Malaysia, and uh, Malaysians are really unhappy about the uh, pollution, including the radioactive pollution from processing the ores in Malaysia. So 
in broad terms and abstract terms, the only solution is recycling and best practice mining of these products that we need for renewable energy. But we haven't got there yet, and we need to be, uh, you know, we need to be more active about that. The environment movement needs to be more active about that. Friends of the Earth needs to be more active about that. Uh, and there isn't a good solution or a good answer at the moment, but there is the prospect of a good solution in terms of, um, you know, equity and uh, and 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 recycling, basically. But I'm sure that Mia can add to that answer. Mia, would you like to speak to that? Um, I think I think that was pretty good. Um, a pretty good summary, but yeah, we need to we need to do much much better with mining in general, and um, recycling is definitely an option. And particularly, we're seeing that a lot of um, that there is a lot of movement around that, and and um, particularly with batteries. So that's positive. But the pollution at the site, we need to have better regulators. We need to have better laws. Um, and yeah. Um, I'm not sure too much what else to say except for that at the front end of the front end of mining, um, and we've seen it also in in Greenland that um, traditional owners there have fought against uh, a mine that was originally a uranium mine that later was proposed um, just to be a rare earth mine with uh, producing some uranium as a byproduct, and the traditional owners have, have just dead against it. They had an election earlier this year. And um, and the the party that said we're absolutely going to shut this mine down won. Um, you know there are some really clear examples where the community are against a project because rare earths are are also not benign. You know there are there are risks and and dangerous elements, and we can't ignore that. We can't bury our heads in the sand around that, and we have to respect um, the rights of communities to be able to say no, um, and we have to expect better of companies and regulators. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think, uh, Jim, did you have a bit more you wanted to say on that? Yeah, just a little bit. Um, in broad terms, the opposition to fossil fuels is because of their connection to climate change. In broad terms, the opposition to nuclear power, amongst other reasons, is its connection to the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which also pose an existential threat. Renewables don't pose an existential threat. They, are, they can be dirty and ugly as they are with some rare earth mining and processing in uh, China and Malaysia and elsewhere, but they're not an existential threat. But that doesn't mean that we should ignore those problems. Uh, but there is work going on on recycling. It is happening to some limited extent, and we just need to be more proactive and more aware about those problems and to uh, uh, deal with them and address them. Absolutely. Thank you so much for answering that. Um, to throw back to you, uh, Mia, there's a question for you here, and it's does the IPC report, IPCC report, sorry, um, make a case for nuclear energy? And if so, what's the deal with that? I'm hoping Jim can answer that one. Um, I, I can't actually remember off the top of my head. I know that it wasn't, um, I couldn't find anything actually, thinking back, I couldn't find much of a description at all about nuclear power in the IPCC report. Um, do you, do you know, Jim? Yeah, um, the last IPCC report I read, IPCC is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It mapped out a whole lot of low carbon energy scenarios and it included scenarios with uh, near zero nuclear power and it included options with uh, fairly significant contribution of nuclear power but um you know it wasn't really advocating anything it was just mapping out scenarios and i think it's helpful to go back to reality 
regardless of what anyone's scenarios are or preferred scenarios are, the reality is that uh, 25 years ago, nuclear contributed 25, uh, sorry, 18% of global nuclear, uh, global electricity production. And now it is down to 10%. And renewables were a very small fraction of electricity production 25 years ago. And now they've gone to 29%. So renewables are almost three times greater than nuclear energy production. And that difference is widening every day. And also, if you look at the Murdoch media, it's just full of absolute BS every single day. But there are people who were nuclear supporters who have read the tea leaves and followed the facts and changed their mind. And one example is Ziggy Switkowski, who led the Howard government's nuclear power review uh, 20 years ago. And now he says that there is no case for large scale nuclear power in Australia now. And you've also got people like, uh, what's his name in WA, Mia? Uh, there's a Twiggy, Twiggy Forrest who was a supporter. And Bob Carr. Yeah, Bob Carr. They were supporters, but they've, they've followed the facts and they understand that nuclear power is not expect, not cheap, uh, it's not timely, and it's not viable in Australia. And I think the most important study there is one by Peter Farley from the Australian Institute of Engineers. And he has crunched the numbers and concluded that uh, renewables are three times cheaper, three times quicker. So if you are serious about climate change abatement, then you will support renewables and you will oppose nuclear power, regardless of any other concerns about nuclear waste or nuclear weapons. If your only concern is climate change, then renewables is the answer. Thank you for answering that, Jim. Um, I have got a, another question from Kev, and that are, what are some of the health effects of the uranium mine on your community? Well, I think you're on uh, mute, uh, Uncle Kev. Thank you. Uh, but the effects go pretty everywhere. It uh, drives you mad. It makes you sick. We've lost so many people from it. And as I said, uh, to get to where their program goes, their developers go, development goes, it's on sacred site. Uh, it destroys sacred sites, does a lot of damage because the old place is it's like the home of your dream time, so to speak. Is we've got places everywhere, people and working that, in the mines as well. People are we are blueing with each other, uh, with the I think Mia mentioned early part the, the native type's got to go. As soon as native parts come in, it's just a corporation. It just divides people. It's making people kill each other, uh, well, argue. Uh, you can't go to someone else's funeral because they don't want you to go there because you're not in their game and vice versa. You're doing wrong. You're doing the deals. It's just, it'll take me two days to think it. People with cancer? And, and all the sickness, cancer, heart attacks. I've lost my own families from all that stuff as well. Old people as well as young people. And I was thinking as I was watching you, we're going to have to do this up the lake, bro. You have to come up to the lake, drag me, drag Scotty and all the mob, the friends of the earth up there, and we'll do a big live right across the for the world to see. Bring the old, the old uncle, our uncle David Appenbar. <laughs> Bring him up there because he knows all about it. Like a plan. Awesome. Um, we've got 
uh, we're running out of time here. So I think um, we might wrap that up for the question section. Um, but if you feel like your, your question wasn't answered properly um, or you, yeah, you've got more inquiries, feel free to shoot uh, nuclearfree at fo.org.au uh, an email and they will do their best to get back to you on that. Um, there's also social media on Facebook and Instagram and on Twitter as well, I'm pretty sure, that um, you're more than welcome to engage with in a respectful way, of course. I once again like to thank um, everyone who was respectful tonight and helped make this a safe place. Um, my solidarity goes to, out to all of you. Um, yeah, now without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Jamila Rushton, who is a member of the Nuclear Free Collective. And they're gonna be giving us some ideas about where to go from here. We've got all this information. Now, Jamila, what do we do? With it? Oh my gosh, how to follow such a great conversation. Thanks so much, Sam. And thanks to all the speakers, it's always really great to hear you and I, I think I just echo Scott wishing that these convos are happening around a campfire and not from um, my lounge room but we, we do the best we can until we can be up at the lake with you Uncle Kev. Um, yeah I think there's there's so much to cover here um, and there's so many different ways to get involved um, and I guess firstly there's a couple of avenues that um, I think that are, yeah it, easy for me to list straight off the bat so um, there's a great list of um, anti-nuke contacts that I think someone will put in the chat at nuclear.fo.org.au forward slash contacts. So that will um, potentially link to a bunch of the organisations that were mentioned on the call. Um, also just really want to invite um, folks um, like our speakers and any of the um, other crew on the call, if you want to put your details in the um, chat for people to get in contact with you, that's please, please go ahead. Um, Friends of the Earth Melbourne, um, we have our nuclear free collective that's been meeting at Friends of the Earth Melbourne um, for a huge amount of time. It's actually where our Friends of the Earth started on a nuclear free campaign. It's our longest running campaign at Friends of the Earth. So um, we're, and it's still going strong. So we'd love to see you. Um, yeah, so please, I think I should go a link in there to get involved and volunteer. Um, there's also an Act on Climate Collective, which Sam is a member of and, and we work alongside too. So um, yeah, there's kind of lots, a bunch of different opportunities at Friends of the Earth Melbourne. Um, yeah, there's also some, yeah, great people on the call here. I know there's folks from the Conservation Council of WA who are working around um, supporting traditional owners in um, preventing new mines um, on their country. Um, and yeah, th yeah, there's some really, uh, maybe KA, you want to put your um, contact in there. Um, so yeah, get involved with the Cons Council if you're in WA. Um, scrolling through my list here, Australian Conservation Foundation, Sweeney's on the call, I think here, they're also doing great work on a national level. Um, yeah, I think there is um, the Australian Nuclear Free Alliance, which Uncle Kev um, is co-president of, I think we heard about earlier in the call, which is um, an alliance of um, First Nations communities and um, organisations who are working to stop the nuclear industry. Um, yep, yeah, great, there's some good links going in the chat, seeing them flood in there. Um, the Australian Student Environment Network, um, always awesome doing on the ground stuff. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with them, um, oh my gosh, so many more. Um, yeah, if you're, and also just really recommend listening to the Radioactive Show. Um, it's on 3CR Radio um, every Saturday morning from 10 to 10.30, or you can uh, listen to the past episodes. Um, it's a really incredible kind of um, grassroots uh, storytelling and, and media outlet, which is talking about the nuclear industry in Australia and abroad. Um, yeah, if you're concerned about the weapons and the links between nuclear power, nuclear industry and nuclear weapons. Um, yeah, I reckon the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons are a great org to get involved with. You might see me moonlighting there on occasion too. Um, and yeah, I guess probably, yeah, I think the, the call is there for um, folks to support First Nations communities. And obviously Uncle Kev has been leading this fight for such a long time. So um, any contributions to Uncle Kev's fighting fund, I think would be a really awesome way to, to get involved. But um, yeah, you can also e email us at nuclear free. Um, what is that? Yeah, on our, yeah, for Melbourne Nuclear Free, if you need to get in contact with anyone or you, you're interested in kind of networking more into the movement. So 
yeah, hope I'm sure there's a lot that we can do, um, particularly around um, the in the lead up to COP. If there's anything, Mia, that um, we can be doing to amplify that, I think the Don't Nuke the Climate is the right Instagram to be following and getting behind on there. So, yeah, that's that's my rant. So thanks, everyone. Thank you much, Jan. It's a um, really awesome to see what the what the legends, uh, uh, friends of the earth, and our allies are doing. And for some sp perspective, I'm pretty sure Foe's turning like 50 or something soon. Um, uh, that's that's how long the uh, nuclear anti nuclear um, stuff has been going for. It really does put it in perspective. Um, all right, I think. Uh, it's almost 8.30, so we're just coming to a close now. If you have any questions, again, please feel free to email um, the Anti-Nuclear Collective, our Friends of the Earth in general. As a reminder, this chat will be saved. I know this, there were some questions, um, but the chat will be saved. And we'll be going up with a follow-up email that will be sent out to all the participants with all the links and resources. Um, and oh, sorry, is this something? Saying something? Yeah. All good. All good. Ah, the Zoom space. Um, there'll be a follow-up survey just to see what we gauge from this. Um, yeah, as uh, it is a anti-hierarchical collective, you know, we want to we want to get together how everyone's taken away from it and improve and um, on Friends of the Earth's work. Um. Uncle Kev, did you have any last words that you'd like to put in? Any last words? Any last words? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think so. Uh, us human beings have come from back there. We have never been in this field before. This is the new field that we have entered. And so we need all sorts of different ideas and skills so that we can get out of this mess that we all been in. And uh, we could do it by doing what we're doing here, zooming people, talking to people, Scotty said, uh, get the fire going, sit around the uh, campfire. But first, he's got to open the border so we can go through. And uh, we, by doing it this way, we can't lose. Well, it's not about winning. Well, it is in that sense. Yeah, we can't lose. Well, it's time for us to all go home, so to speak. And we know the way home. We know where home is. And uh, we can't fly around up there and up there forever. We've got to land somewhere. So, yeah, that's good. And it's good to be on there. We just got to educate, re-educate each other about what it is that we want. And uh, make sure that uh, we leave the place safe and clean for the little ones okay thanks very much sam that's all good thank you so much uncle kev all right well it's 8 30. um thank you everyone so much for coming uh it was really awesome to create the space and yeah i'm 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 honored uh to be able to speak to you and to be um, the facilitator. So thank you for having me. Um, my love and solidarity goes out to all of you. Uh, and I hope we can all stay safe um, during these times. Yeah, so I wish everyone a lovely evening um, and have a great night. <laughs> How are you, brother? Okay, I've got to get the jacket on. Still got me on that.